Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to give a keynote lecture at the 16th International Congress on Psychiatry and 4th International Congress on Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. The topic of my lecture is that around digital addiction medicine, which I um, coined the, the title as New Opportunities Essential Services. My name is Alex Baldacchino, and I am a clinical academic working with NHS Scotland as a senior specialist in addiction medicine, trained as a psychiatrist. I'm also a professor in medicine, psychiatry and addictions at the University of St. Andrews. <clears throat> I was honored to work for some time with WHO, actually based in Cairo, um, in the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases. I also work on behalf of NHS 5 in Scotland as Research and Development Director. And additionally, I am also the President for the International Society of Addiction Medicine, which is a, a group of around 20,000 clinicians, specialists in the field of addictions and gener gener generalists in the field of addictions, who um, um, identify the need to continue um, learning in the field, identifying needs, uh, providing specialist uh, examination and interventions, and with, with, with the intention of providing the best of service for patients that we serve. So, digitalization. It's never been, you know, the right time. We talked about digitalization. Digitalization is not a new thing. Um, but of course, you know, it was, has um, challenged the, the, the world and society in the last uh, one, one and a half years has made it paramount that we should really look at um, how we can exploit the digitalization as a catalyst for health and social care transformation. And again, as I said, these um, notions and um, aspirations are not new, but with um, COVID, it has uh, speeded up the need to understand better what we mean by digitalization and also what um, can digitalization do in order to support a better service for substance use disorders. And um, essentially, digitalization and the, the, this paradigm shift is shifting our core strategic focus from infrastructure to data, information, and knowledge, as well as competencies. And the, the work streams involved um, in order to maximize digitalization in any aspect of health and social care should have the following uh, six components. It should be pa patient-centered should be based on adequate information and knowledge. I call it intelligent information. It should be based around the need to work even more around um, with other uh, disciplines and agencies. It should have a, a workforce that is digitally, digitally enabled. And here I would also say um, a patient population that is digitally assertive and not uh, digitally poor. And the last two include uh, an adequate infrastructure application standards in order to provide this notion of digital addiction medicine and as well using the state of the arts and um, to look at how we can implement research and innovation and implementation using digitalization. This of course goes uh, very well with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And it, it also um, makes sense when you look at a notion of precision psychiatry or precision addiction psychiatry, precision addiction medicine, where a notion of data, irrespective of what type of data and who has collected the data, um, should come together in order to provide a biosignature of the patient population that we see and, and that uh, biosignature would allow um, the population of interest to be studied further into um, looking at new 
trials or other uh, therapy interventions, seeing the effect or not, and uh, by also having a very precise differential diagnosis and endophenotyping of the population, we're also able to predict prognosis and identify the factors that are essentially of risk in creating poor prognostic features. So my uh, lab in St. Andrews, for example, tends to utilize big data, tends to utilize cognitive neuroscience, neuro neuropsychology data, environmental data, and individual clinical characteristics. And using the digi digital platform would provide a um, very interesting way of um, identifying a very ecologically valid biosignature of the population of interest. But of course, you know, we are all um, using end parts of the digital environment, and as a result, um, you know, we are also users of the digital fields. Some are better than others. Um, assumption that the younger generation are much better than the older generation. But um, equally, we tend to um, assume that actually, um, you know, having a mobile phone is makes one think that they are um, savvy and aware of how one can utilize the digital field in any field of interest. But th this is the reality, and this is statistics from January 2021. And um, looking at the last two, three years, you find that there's been a surge of active social media users, internet users, uh, unique mobile phone users, with a total population of around 56.4% of the global population using some form of digital media. Okay, so what are the six digital technologies that I think are changing the um, addiction medicine field? And, um, and these are, in summary, what I think is the uh, smartphone applications, the big data, the machine learning and artificial intelligence, electronic health systems, wastewater analysis, and uh, 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 a mixture of um, technologies, new technologies, that um, are able to utilize small spaces and, um, as a result, can do quite um, inventive and um, unimaginable in the last um, 10 years or so um, aspects of how addiction medicine can move forward. So I'll go through um, one after the other. Uh, it's important really, you know, I, I presented this um, talk in 2016 and, uh, and then in 2018, and I'm presenting this again in 2021. Of course, the, the field um, has, you know, exponentially um, improved um, field is, is unimaginably uh, large and complex, and of course um, the 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 confidence to utilize these um, technologies is is even greater. And I think that's partly because global society had to, as a result of the pandemic, to to be savvy and and to use these. Um, as soon as possible, in order, especially in order to provide an essential service. So we start with the first one, smartphone application. The element of being connected digitally by email, of course, SMS, for example, telehealth, and also through geolocations. And um, I know uh, from the audience and people listening to this talk that um, they instantly recognize and identify to what I'm, I'm talking about. But of course, this has been and used in, and increasingly being applicate, um, created applications and apps in order to support individuals with substance use disorders, especially in people who are of high risk of opioid overdose. Uh, these are examples of publications around the use of smartphones in order to try and um, reduce the risk of alcohol consumption among risk drinkers, using text in order to um, intervene, in order to support people to reduce binge drinking among disadvantaged men, and uh, my smoke is uh, using GPS 
systems in order to support individuals who might be um, putting themselves at risk for two relapse with um, nicotine. Many, many examples, please. And of course, part of this application is that there, is, there are also at home or portable diagnostics, uh, which are most of the time wireless and, um, and, and provide um, wearable sensors in order to identify physiological markers and also to assist in, in diagnosis. Uh, some have been uh, utilized for the general population and or for specific purposes, but all this technology is now increasingly being used in order to support individuals again um, to identify individuals who might be the tipping point of being sedated to being um, irreversibly at the point of overdosing and dying. But also, you know, the physiological markers provides us with the right um, markers. I remember a patient I saw last week who essentially told me wearing one of these um, uh, wearable sensors told me that his oxygen saturation was at 95% and he's been monitoring that because he has a, a comorbid condition of chronic obstructive airway disease. And of course, these applications can also be used for digital therapeutics. And this is the, the what I would call the classic, classic um, um, platform within which these applications are being used in the field of addiction and psychiatry. And these are, for example, um, mobile telephone delivered contingency management, uh, health-related internet uh, use in order to uh, provide um, motivation interviewing and motivation enhancement therapy for people who are opioid treatment seekers, and uh, many, many other examples. One, one EU-funded project is uh, this what was pre-mobile, a PC-based intervention within which individuals with substance use disorders would put in their behavior and through an algorithm would um, inform these, these same individuals the risk of morbidity and mortality and as a result provide them with the incentive to change their risky behavior. It's called the Orion. So the second um, technology that's changing addiction is big data, big data. And um, a lot of data is being collected. What I mean by data, big data is that that is able to be cleaned, able to be interrogated, able to be linked with other data, and able to extract the relevant data in order to have um, the appropriate information that you're looking for. And this is a system, systems in place that um, have been used for the last 20 years for general purposes, uh, health and social care purposes. But these are examples that um, my lab in, in St. Andrews and Fife, together with the University of Dundee, have, have used linked data in the field of substance misuse, and that is to understand better the prescribing of analgesics in people with substance use problem, but also in the general population, and also the co-prescribing of gabapentin and benzodiazepam and, um, and opioids. And we use, the, we use data linkage in order to understand compliance and the effect of non-compliance to mortality and morbidity. Um, other areas is looking at and identifying people who are on suboxone methadone prospectively follow up and identify outcome measures for these uh, populations. Um, other, other processes to identify the effects um, of alcohol brief intervention in A and D uh, admissions and many, many others. And these are examples of publications that I just, just mentioned. Third one is more technical, and this is the fact that um, analysis and um, especially statistical analysis in the field of dig this digitalization has become more sophisticated and we're moving uh, beyond the ANCOVA and this is around machine learning which is a method of data analysis that automates analytic model building and uses algorithms that iteratively learn from data and uh, machine learning 
allows computers to find hidden insights without being explicit in the program where to look. And uh, there are different types of machine learning. Some are supervised, some are unsupervised. And here on the right hand side, you see the different types of analytic frameworks that um, individuals are using when um, looking at um, data. Uh, it, it, the limitation of machine learning is that you need a lot of data. Um, but as you can see from a recent publication in Lancet Digital Health, it is um, being increasingly used in order to model, pre pre to, to create predictive modeling for um, opioid use, opioid emergencies, opioid um, overloads, etc. So watch this space for this. The next digital technology is that of uh, creating an electronic health system. What I mean is a learning health system where the internal data and the experience are systematically integrated with external evidence and that knowledge is put into practice. And as a result, patients get higher quality, safer, more efficient care where they need it, when they need it. And this is an example that we have delivered for NHS Scotland, where we have used GP data, hospital data, link those data, and the information that's coming out is supporting stakeholders, commissioning, commissioners, clinicians, and also researchers. It's called the Electra project. Another um, uh, way of utilizing uh, electronic health records is the opportunity to create a, a, a telemedication assistant treatment in order to uh, provide the right technology, um, which is highly identified, highly accessible, um, can provide harm reduction advice, can um, provide and empower patients um, to take their own clinical observations, for example, with a saturation probe, and also to plan treatment, to stabilize treatment, and titrate treatment, and also to medical review treat, treatment. The classic example is the use of the uh, digital hubs and um, where individuals go in and patients and doctors and clinicians will be able to see them in a digitally as we had to when um, the first and second lockdown um, occurred. The fifth one, which I would not uh, spend too much time, but um, I'm sure you're very, very familiar because wastewater analysis has been used for COVID as well in order to identify the virus spread. But in this case, wastewater analysis has been used for the last 10 years in the field of substance use in order to identify cities and areas and um, what their prevalence of drug use is and this is very simply done by um, it going to specific areas identify and um, take samples of sewage and um, identify through um, sophisticated uh, biochemical and other measures the uh, type of drugs that is present in those samples Sixth one, last but not least, the sixth one is a group of you know, emerging uh, new technologies. And here I'll just mention them because you know, that's, it's, it's another presentation for this. The use of smart pills. I mean, you swallow these pills and these pills will tell you if you're fit or not and are increasingly being used for gastrointestinal um, pathology, especially colonic and other types of malignancies. Implantable drug delivery, this has come in the field of substance misuse in the form of Buvidal and other um, pharmacotherapies which are provided either as six monthly rods or, or subcutaneous, um, um, subcutaneous injection on a monthly basis for people with opioid dependence. But of course we have neurotechnology and percutaneous nerve stimulation which um, is and in increasingly the evidence showing that this type of uh, intervention is effective in people with substance use problems. But of course, you know, this is, I wouldn't say early days, but, um, you know, like everything else, when, when we, we create these um, frameworks, there are concerns. And, um, you know, about, you know, lack or too much transparency is 
about who is controlling the data, your personal data, um, privacy by design, who's accountable. And, uh, and this, this has, and, and is still creating some concerns and anxieties. How big does the data need to be? When, when would you um, ask individual, individuals to consent that we and other people are using uh, aggregate data, you know, non-identifiable data? But then again, you know, big data is being sold to the private sector. Um, do we have ethically the, the right to do that? when it comes to uh, the population who is happy to share data because uh, we work in, with, a, with the government and, and then we find that this data is, is a commodity and can, can, can be sold to other stakeholders. So lots of these concerns. And I've, I've listed the pitfalls of technologies within the care setting. So as I said, there are clinician patient concerns about this. You know, having the right digital platform, knowing all about the, the way you can operate this does not necessarily mean that this is the right way of um, supporting patients. And also not assuming that patients have the right mobile phones, the, the uh, uh, Wi-Fi, internet coverage, and et cetera, et cetera, which we call digital poverty. Right now. The cost, you know, nothing is free. And uh, one needs to be careful that uh, these do not become expensive toys. One needs to continuously evaluate the usefulness and the efficacy of these um, interventions. As I mentioned earlier, data security and information governance needs to be there from day one of utilizing any form of digital platform. Um, again, you know, to, to what extent should one use um, digital addiction medicine to manage, to treat, and to intervene. And um, my personal opinion is that it should uh, add value to current traditional um, services rather than replace face-to-face uh, -face and, um, uh, you know, and face-to-face and, and, uh, -face interventions. Big data does not necessarily mean high quality data, as you can imagine. Other pitfalls include the complexity of the data analysis, and the skills needed to do so, so it starts to become very, very specialized and um, ecologically non-valid and not related to the outside world, the reality of the world that we live in and that uh, the world that patients live in. Lack of complementary data, such as qualitative surveys, to provide uh, the ecological truth. The, this, um, these other methodologies should still be there, and we should not really ignore um, traditional, if we want to use the word, um, data collection and methodology, quantitative and qualitative methodologies. Of course, you know, um, a lack of empathic, empathetic significance in the patient journey and, um, you know, can, can start to creep in. And this is a, a danger that, you know, we, we finish up being, um, you know, humanized, digitalized, um, um, competent individuals who are more around, um, you know, getting the data and identifying um, who is more at risk, other than asking the patients themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, this is over. So I would suggest to you all the ABCD of responding to the introduction and the, of digital uh, addiction medicine, which is here to stay, is a advocacy, attitudes, improvements, this needs to be um, the, the, the core element of um, creating any form of digital intervention and implementing a digitalized service. A better and appropriate quality treatment should be the, the, the aim for all this, creating a, resilience, a resilient system that is able to support um, you know, a, a, an addiction service that um, has all sorts of uh, complex needs, all sorts of different patients, and um, is able to move along with the uh, differences in patient needs, differences in the complexities of the pathologies, the multiple morbidities that patients present with. The development should happen with dignity and integrity, and of course, we strive that everyone will have that enthusiasm for evidence. 
thank you very much and I hope you found this um, lecture uh, informative and please if you would want more information get in touch with me on amb30 at saintandrews.ac.uk thank you very much <laughs>